While the Tau are definitely a force to be reckoned with, I think we can all agree that they've gotten stupid lucky to get to this point, right? Um... What you got there? It's a smoothie. Hi, I'm Chrono the Harlequin, and welcome back to Live from the Black Library, where today I want to talk to you about the very uncertain future of the Tau Empire. Specifically, I want to talk about how the Tau Empire has a lot of trouble on the horizon, and how they might have to deal with it. Because I find it to be a very interesting topic, with regard to how societies change and evolve when presented with new problems they hadn't faced before. You see, we all know about the Tau Schism between Commander Farsight and the Farsight Enclaves, versus the Ethereals and the rest of the Tau Empire proper. But a second schism is brewing, and this one is very different because it is a religious conflict. And of course I'm talking about the rise of the goddess Tauva in the Warp, a small nascent warp god that has shown itself to be both real and powerful, which is starting to gain support as seen in the book Shadow Sun, the Patient Hunter. But before that, I just want to say thank you so much for watching this video, and please subscribe if you have not already done so, as it does really help me out. Now without further ado, let's get into why the Tau Empire might be doomed. Before we talk about the coming second schism, let's talk about the first one. This was the one with Commander Farsight, and his leave with the Farsight Enclaves. You see, the reason for this schism was largely political, and that's an important distinction to make. You see, Farsight rebelled against the Ethereals because resentment between elements of the Fire Warrior cast and the Ethereals had been building for quite some time. Farsight was just sort of the logical endpoint of that enmity. And the reason for this was because of the Ethereals meddling in military affairs, something that all came to a head when Farsight would fight against demons on the planet of Arthas Moloch and become increasingly frustrated with the ethereals he was meant to serve under. However, when they would all be killed and he would take direct control, he would turn the tide of the battle and realize, wow, we really don't need the ethereals, and then break off to form the Farsight Enclaves. We've seen this before in human history, where military leaders have been frustrated with their politicians and then just broken off. A good example could, in a way, be the Mamluks who controlled Egypt, the Mamluks having been a cast of enslaved soldiers. So, Farsight would break away, form his own society, and the Ethereals would not take that lightly, launching successive campaigns against Farsight's enclaves and denouncing him as a traitor to the greater good. This enmity actually ran so deep that when unarmed transports of refugees were headed to the Farsight enclaves, they would be fired upon by Tau Imperial troops and destroyed, because they did not want anyone going into the Enclaves. Now, again, this might seem ideological on the outside, but it is also political, because the Farsight Enclaves pose an existential threat to the caste system the Tau live under, and the rule of the Ethereals, so obviously they can't tolerate it. This is obviously a big problem, but I think it pales in comparison to the next coming schism, because it is a religious one. There's really two books that come into play here for this scenario, and that being Shadow Sun the Patient Hunter and War of Secrets. We'll start with War of Secrets because that book came out first and it does provide context. It's the first time we see the Tau Goddess. What happens is Sure Strike, leading the fourth sphere of expansion, gets trapped in the warp and beset by demons. It's here he learns two important things. One, the presence of the demons is generally tied to the psychically active Tau Auxiliaries, and that there is a Tau Goddess. In fact, it saves the fourth sphere of expansion, becoming their section of the warp and opening a portal for them to go back out into the Materium. It even physically lifts them out with one of its hands. And Surestrike's first thought is to kill the thing. You see, here Commander Surestrike cuts a deal with the Dark Angels, because he knows about the existence of the Tau Goddess, and more specifically why it exists. The fact that Tau Auxiliaries, especially humans, are creating this thing because of their belief in the Tau Va in a more spiritual sense, as opposed to the Tau's atheistic sense. So, he gets the Dark Angels to go after Tau Auxiliaries, while the Dark Angels assign him to go after a world that may well know the existence of some of the Fallen. It's a really dark quid pro quo. However, obviously he can't wipe out all humans in the Tau Empire, nor stamp out the nascent religion of Tau Va. And as such, there are still more and the god is still growing, something that he knows. So, when a Council of Ethereals is called to deal with things going on around the Star Tide Nexus attended by Shadow Sun, 
he tries to make his stand and says that the auxiliaries are dangerous and cannot be trusted. He basically tries to explain his stance to the Ethereal Council, but actually ends up getting attacked by a crude and sort of kicked out for the time being. However, when Shadow Sun finds out the truth about what Sure Strike was doing, she ends up eventually getting injured in an assault by the Death Guard, who are becoming a significant problem for the Tau Empire. And Sure Strike is given overall command of Tau forces. However, he's put back under Shadow Sun's command after she proves herself to be a steady hand when she turns back a Death Guard assault with just a small handful of auxiliaries. But the thing is, she was only able to do this because of her faith in the Tau religion. You see, it is revealed over the course of the book Shadow Sun the Patient Hunter that the goddess Tauva has been communicating with Shadow Sun ever since she was a child, steadily guiding her and protecting her. That's a huge deal. And at the end of this book, she actively tells her auxiliaries, especially the human ones, to start praying. And when they start praying, the Tau goddess intervenes. Eventually, the Death Guard ship, though, gets past the Tau and into the Startide Nexus, which normally would lead it towards the core Tau world. You see, Nurgle wants the Tau Empire destroyed because it's, quote, too clean and he wants to see it corrupted. It makes sense, but it's a little bit poorly explained. However, the ship, led by the Death Guard leader, is intercepted and destroyed by the Tau Goddess. The captain of the Death Guard comes face to face with the god, and when it explains what it is, he says, no, that's not possible. The Tau are atheistic. They have no psychic signature in the warp. She says, yes, but their auxiliaries do, before crushing the ship and driving him to insanity. This also isn't the only instance we see of Tauva worship being effective against the forces of chaos, specifically Nurgle. You see, when Shadow Sun is going about clearing out various hive worlds under Tau control, she finds that the plague of Nurgle can't fully reach shrines dedicated to Tau Va, and as such, she stops ordering their destruction and just lets them be. Now, it should also note, there are also shrines popping up across Tau space dedicated to Nurgle and dedicated to the Star Child, which is a facet of the Emperor and is its own can of worms. So, this here is the crux of a second Tau schism. Instead of a political one, it would be a religious one. Because not only do we see that there is a spreading worship of the goddess Tauva in myriad forms, but also it's starting to win converts within Tau society. An example being Shadow Sun. And here's the thing. A lot of people might immediately think, well, that's just her. Tauva has been reaching out to her personally since she was a kid. But if her, why not other Tau as well? There definitely could be some other ones who are maybe hearing voices but just don't know it. Furthermore, there's also the fact that some of the younger Tau are actually adopting elements of human culture and mannerism. You see, there's an instance in a short story where a young Tau says to her squad mate, I'm going to become the pilot of a battlesuit despite what some naysayer says. And the older Tau leading her questions, what does naysayer mean? And she proudly shows off, oh yeah, it's a human word. It basically means someone who says negative things and dedicates their personality off that. And the older Tau is basically really dismissive of that, thinking, yeah, that's a very human thing, basing your personality off negativity. And more than just the cultural difference, he also basically has a boomer moment where he thinks it smacks of trendiness. But it is indicative of a growing gap in Tau society between more traditionalist conservatives and the younger Tau who are more used to a large human presence. Because humans are so numerous, there's just going to be more and more in the Empire if things keep going the way they are, you know, if they stave off destruction. However, that will mean a spreading of the Tau religion. Now, it should be noted, humans are allowed to, for the most part, keep worshipping the Emperor in Tau space. However, that's not really how it plays out in reality. You see, Pagans who ended up under Christian rule, or Christians who ended up under Islamic rule when those religions really began to spread, were nominally allowed to keep believing what they believed, but their fates would die out with time and they would eventually convert. 
Now, North Africa and the Middle East are almost entirely Muslim, and all the Scandinavian pagans are now Lutherans. So, given this and the disconnect from Terra, it was understandable that humans in Tau space were going to drift away from the Imperial cult. But given the canonical fact that in Warhammer, humans tend towards faith, worship, and religion as a species-wide default, this was only ever going to be inevitable. They would either make their own interpretation of the Talva or turn to chaos, both of which are currently happening. And furthermore, it's accompanied by the predictable human zealotry. There's actually an instance where we see Sure Strike's Fire Warriors approaching a bunch of humans who are like, yeah, yeah, for the greater good, for the greater good, right up until they start opening fire on the humans, and then the human whose POV we're following and seeing this through is thinking, don't worry, it's fine, they fight for the greater good, it's okay, they're doing this for a reason. Like, it's a massive cope, but it really shows just how dogged humans are when they really believe in something. Now, we're gonna put a pin in Star Child as well as Chaos, because Chaos in particular is universally seen as bad by all factions of the Tau Empire. No one's gonna side with them. But let's get into the nitty gritty of why a religious schism in the Tau Empire would be so destructive based on real historical examples. You see, the first thing I wanna look at is the rise of early Christianity. Now bear with me here. You see, when Christians first appeared in the Roman Empire, they were very oppressed and their faith didn't spread all that far, because again, crackdowns and just how slowly information spread back then. However, during the 3rd century crisis, when literally everything was going wrong in the Roman Empire, emperors were rising and falling left and right, invasions by barbarians and Persians were happening non-stop, and the economy was in freefall, the burgeoning Christian church would step in and see Christianity spread to around 10% of the empire's population. Pretty significant, but not huge. However, by 323 AD, Christians would make up over half of the Roman Empire, and it would be declared the state religion. So what caused this sea change? Well, it would be the rise of Constantine the Great to the imperial throne with his victory in the Roman Civil War. Constantine would begin to favor Christians in the empire during the Civil War, specifically before the pivotal battle of the Milvian Bridge where he would finally be victorious, he would have his soldiers paint the Cairo the first two letters in the name Christ, on the front of their shields. However, a little aside here, it should be noted that the reason the pagan soldiers were okay with this is because the Cairo was also used in Greek as an abbreviation for the word Kreston, and the symbol of the P over the X, well, that's what it looks like, was used to mark a specific passage in a book or text that was particularly notable and connotated as being good. So to the Christians, it meant Jesus, but to the pagans, it just meant auspiciousness. So after taking power, Constantine would favor Christians and eventually make it the official religion of the empire, being involved in Christian affairs. And while they were not fully accepted initially, because obviously a lot of indoctrination and oppression takes time to get over, Having someone in a public position favor them and patron them meant a lot and really allowed the religion to spread. And now the worshippers of Tauva have exactly that, Shadow Sun. I don't want to say, however, that Shadow Sun is the equivalent of Emperor Constantine, because again, he was an emperor, but she is still in a strong position to protect them covertly and not oppress them. She's the leader of overall military forces in the Tau Empire around the Star Tide Nexus, one of the most valuable defensive hardpoints. So she is in a perfect position to feed information to the nascent Tauva faith and have people protected, such as directing forces led by Shurstrike, who is now back under her command, away from places she knows they are gathering or congregating, as well as concealing their existence from the Ethereals. And again, I want to state this, she's not just in this pragmatically. She is a true believer. By the end of the book, she is openly praying to Talva, not just to stave off the Death Guard, but just as to give thanks. But here's the thing. The rise of a Tau faith, not just among the auxiliaries, but also possibly younger Tau, would be catastrophic for the Ethereals, because if you can verify a working faith with a living god, that will undermine their power so much, especially since they had been pushing atheism from the get-go. It would basically delegitimize everything. And we already know the Ethereals are prone to keep secrets that could undermine civil order. It's for that reason the average Tau has no idea how big the Imperium of Man is, because that would just cause them to panic. 
it's only really the Ethereals and some of the higher ups in the Fire Warriors and Earthcast who fully understand what the Tau are up against. You see, the way Tau Ethereals tend to deal with problems similar to this, such as pro imperial factions and dissenters within their ranks, is using what is known as the Soviet method, in that those people will simply just disappear. The problem is, that's not really going to stop a faith from spreading once it already has its hooks in a population. Word of mouth will keep going from population to population, from group to group, especially among the lower classes, in this case the auxiliaries. And you can't really assassinate your way out of that. The fact of the matter is, in any realistic sense, the Tau faith will keep spreading. So what are the ethereals to do? Well, are you familiar with the book Catch-22 by Joseph Keller? It's basically about these allied World War II pilots flying very dangerous missions in Italy. And obviously, some of them want to get out of doing this because the casualty rate is so high. But there is a way out of it. All you have to do is be insane, which is pretty easy. If you're flying out there, you're obviously insane, because only a crazy person would go out on these missions. But you need the doctor to declare you insane. All you have to do for that is ask, Doctor, I'm insane, I can't go out on these missions. However, this rule has a catch, called Catch-22, which states that a concern for one's well-being in the face of dangers that are both real and immediate is the product of a sound mind. Therefore, if you go to a doctor and ask to be grounded by reason of insanity, that means you're sane. So you have to go out and fly more missions, something only a crazy person would do. But if you try and mention that fact, that means you're not crazy and therefore have to fly the missions. The term Catch-22 has entered into our lexicon to describe a situation where the contradictory rules prevent any forward progress or a solution being reached. A more modern example is the trap a lot of people find where you can't get a job without first having experience in that field, but you can't get experience in that field without first getting a job in that field. And this is basically the situation the Tau Ethereals will find themselves in. This faith is spreading and winning converts and is therefore a threat to the legitimacy of the Ethereals. So, they'll need to instigate crackdowns to keep it under control. But instigating crackdowns against non-human auxiliaries will undermine the leadership of the Ethereals because it goes against a lot of the foundational values of the Tau Empire. And it will also likely create martyrs for this faith which, as we know, will only ever win more converts. So they need to stop the spread of this faith, which means they'll have to crack down on the faith, which will only cause it to spread further and weaken their position. However, if they do nothing, this faith will continue to spread unchecked, which will inevitably weaken their position because they're atheists. This is an atom-perfect example of a Catch-22 in practice. And if they do nothing, the religion will keep spreading, and that could lead to civil war, where a large chunk of the Tau Empire says to the Ethereals, you are faithless, therefore you are not fit to lead. And as we know from history, wars on the basis of religion are often way more brutal than wars about politics. A good example of this is the Thirty Years' War, which was so bad people literally thought the seals of the apocalypse were opening, and that the Four Horsemen had descended upon the world. For those of you who don't fully know, the Thirty Years' War was a massive conflict across Europe between Protestants and Catholics, and it was incredibly brutal as previously stated. However, Catholic France would join the conflict on the side of the Protestants against fellow Catholics because those Catholics, the Habsburgs, were their rivals for dominance in Europe. Wars can start on the basis of religion, but politics is often never far behind. And interestingly, if a war of faith like this did break out in the Tau Empire, it would only take one ethereal, who maybe wants to set himself up as an emperor of the Tau, to break with the ethereal caste, declare himself to be of the faith, and ascend to a position of power like Constantine did. Now, for being honest, I think if they ever did go that route in a book, that ethereal would almost certainly die and fail in the attempt. However, it is an interesting scenario to think through. But in any case, it seems like the Ethereals may well be screwed, especially since the Tau Faithful have a literal god on their side. However, the Ethereals have their own weapon, and that being Commander Surestrike himself. Surestrike, who is so loyal to the Ethereals that he is willing to kill a god to maintain their power. Surestrike, who will do what they say even after they throw him out of meetings and denounce him as talking nonsense, 
and Sure Strike, who may well have the only viable way for the Ethereals to nip this in the bud, and that being working with the Imperium against a common enemy. The Imperium would never tolerate the rise of a Tau Goddess, even if it did weaken their rivals, the Tau Empire. And Sure Strike has already flexed connections with the Dark Angels in order to get the job done. He is loyal, he is ruthless, and he is crafty, and I believe he would be perfectly willing to either become the public figurehead of the Ethereal Conservative movement, if it does come to open conflict, or become their shadowy left hand, eliminating targets in secret and cutting deals with the Imperium. Hell, I believe he would start doing this without the Ethereals even calling on him because he's shown he will already do that. I genuinely believe if played right, Sure Strike could be set up to be the first really intimidating and effective villain for the Tau race. So you would have Sure Strike, Conservatives and Ethereals on one side, Shadow Sun, the Worshippers of Tau Va, and Liberals on the other side, likely including most Auxiliaries, and Farsight with the Enclaves directly in the middle. I don't believe he would crack down directly on the Faith in Tau Va, but he would absolutely be wary of it, especially given his close brushes with Korn. Interestingly, both sides might actually try and court him, putting him in the position of Kingmaker. There's also an interesting thing I want to bring up, and that's demographics. You see, Tau breed very slowly. They're only allowed to breed with other members of their caste, and are only allowed to do so when the Ethereals give the go-ahead, as far as we can tell as observers. It is very slow, and it is very deliberate, and each child gets a lot of attention and care growing up, unlike humans who breed, according to Eldar, like weeds. They're literally called a weed race, and who are clustered together in settlements like hive cities, things the Tau can never really gain full control over. Now, we might not have full population numbers for the amount of Tau in the Empire or the amount of other auxiliaries, it is a reasonable assumption that humans will eventually start to make up more and more of the Empire as other highly populated worlds get brought into the fold and humans already in the Empire continue to breed unchecked on majority human planets. You see, the Tau do try and control human population growth, either with chemicals or even with minor surgeries. But this is a lot harder to do when you start getting into hive worlds. The Tau, when they get a hold of those, tend to leave them alone as long as they don't rebel because they just flatly can't exert that much control over them. And in the novel Last Chancers, a commissar explains to a Tau that the hive city he came from had about a billion humans in it and there were 13 such cities on the planet. The Tau basically panics, thinking that's more humans on one planet than there are Tau in an entire sept. A sept basically being a system that is named after a core sept world. So while we don't get clear numbers for how big a sept is and they do vary in size, you could consider them almost like subsectors. So one human hive world has more people on it than there are Tau in an entire subsector. So, as you can imagine, population could become a big problem. I don't believe humans would ever outnumber the Tau in their own empire, but what happens when these zealous, faith-driven humans start to become 20, 25, 30, 35 percent of the empire's population? Even if they weren't being immediately disruptive, this would spark a population anxiety within the Tau elite. And here's the thing, trying to control the ability of a population to reproduce is a really good way to start fostering resentment and possible rebellion. And there's also the fact that while yes, the Tau will rule with a light touch in some places, they still have to provide for those people. The way they get people on side is by promising them a better life than they would have in the Imperium. But if they can't feed an entire planet with the population greater than a whole sept, then they don't really have much of a claim to the population's loyalty. If they don't hold up their end of the bargain, the humans won't either. The Tau are already canonically having to deal with things like pro-imperial suicide bombers to begin with, so planets going into full-scale revolt would be damn near impossible for them. The Imperium are experts at internal repressions and putting down revolts, but the Tau just haven't really had to deal with that sort of thing. And who would the Ethereals need to turn to to actually get that job done? Someone like Sure Strike. So, it's for these reasons, the rise of the Tau faith, the nature of the greater good itself, changing population demographics, and rising population pressure, that I believe the Tau Empire is in for a very rough go of it moving forward. But what do you guys think? 
Do you guys think I'm overplaying the amount of problems a rising human population could have in the Imperium? Do you think I'm overplaying the importance of the Tau faith? Do you think the Ethereals might en masse have a change of heart and embrace Tau Va as their goddess? I would love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments below. Please subscribe if you have not already done so, and I will see you in the next video.